It's my pleasure to present Anna Grasselino. She is a SQMS Center Director. Uh, so she will talk about the center. And then our next speaker is going to be Alex Romanenko. She is a CTO at Fermilab and also leader of technology uh, devices um, at uh, SQMS. Thank you, Silvia. Okay, I'll use this one. Okay, sorry for the technical difficulties. It's my pleasure to be here today with you guys to tell you a little bit about SQMS. Uh, I heard that the school is going really well. So we thought it was a nice idea to tell you a little bit about what the SQMS Center does, what our goals are. Uh, the school is one of our milestones. Uh, one of the components of, the, of this quantum centers is actually to really train a new generation of uh, quantum workforce. So we're very glad that this is going really well. And also that you actually prefer to do this rather than going to the beach in July. Um, <laughs> that makes you... <laughs> All right, so... Um, Let's see. Uh, questo? Devo, devo puntare qua? Ok, faccio direttamente da lì. Ok, perfect. Allora, so, um, a little bit of context of what these centers are. Um, in 2018, uh, there was this bill uh, passed um, that directed the president, it's called National Quantum Initiative Act, directed the president to implement a national quantum initiative program. It's a 10 year program that tasked various parts of the government to kind of ramp up investments in quantum information science in the United States. And in particular, um, so the bill defines quantum information science as storage, transmission, manipulation or measurement of information encoded in systems that can only be described by the laws of quantum physics. And these are various uh, agencies that were tasked to ramp up research programs. Uh, and we are Department of Energy. So Fermilab is one of the 17 national laboratories in the United States. It's kind of very similar to INFN in Italy. Um, so we are funded, uh, uh, but, but so we are the only national lab in the United States, which is actually funded to do really re fundamental research in particle physics. So we had started doing a little bit of research in quantum information science uh, just a few years uh, ago. And then when this opportunity came up, actually we applied for one of these centers. So the Department of Energy was actually tasked to create a research program in quantum and in particular establish five national centers about an investment of $600 million for five years. These five centers are to be led by national labs. And so it was actually an open competition. We bid, we put a thousand page proposal together and, uh, and we actually got it. So Fermilab leads one of the five national centers. Um, this is uh, what I was just talking about. Uh, it was supposed to be 625, in the end it's 575, but anyway, so the goal of these centers is really to bring a transformational advancement in, in quantum. Um, and uh, they're supposed to be multidisciplinary centers that bring together uh, experts from a variety of fields, all under one roof, really to be able to advance quantum technologies and to uh, demonstrate quantum advantage. I think by now you understand that, that you need the expert in material, then you need the expert in the device, then you need the expert in the application that could be you know, high energy physics, could be condensed matter physics. You heard a little bit about this uh, in these days. Um, and, and much more. So I'll give you a glimpse of what it is. But so that's the point of the centers. So, so the centers are different than, let's say, what we call base research programs. So there are also individual grants that go to professors or other various places. But the centers really want to do this. Bring together many experts, demonstrate it's, you are more than the sum of the parts. And so we'll tell you a little bit about the story of what we put together, what we want to demonstrate with SQMS. Um, and, uh, ah, and the other thing that was important is these centers are supposed to bring together industry, academia, and national laboratories. So that's also very nice. And uh, of course, uh, it's, it's kind of like a social experiment. We are all very different in our goals and our backgrounds, but it's really important though, to bridge those gaps. So we put together this proposal. Um, we are at the, at the stage of the proposal, we were less, I think we were about 20 partners. Um, and we now have already grown to 23 partner institutions. We have more than 350 researchers. We support more than hundreds of students and postdocs across all these institutions. So the core partner, so Fermilab is the lead of the center and the host 
and uh, our core partners are up here, Rigetti Computing. Uh, so again, remember I just told you, we need to bring together national labs with the industry, with academia. So I will not go through all of it. So at Northwestern, for example, we support 17 professors that uh, are experts in a variety of fields from material science all the way to you know, fundamental particle physics. Uh, um, Ames Lab, we have Peter Orth here that uh, uh, you, have, you have been learning from him. Um, we, they bring a great expertise in condensed matter physics and material science, unique facilities. Uh, and NASA, uh, we, we have Norm, I believe, who was part of the, of the lectures. So the group of, uh, of NASA is on computational science a type of expertise. And INFN, just to pick, you know, you can see there's much more. I will not go through the list, but INFN, of course, is we couldn't do this without NFN. Um, uh, they are our sister lab, I mean, partner for, for, for decades with Fermilab, but we designed the most complex experiments, you know, to search for dark matter, to search for the Higgs boson, uh, back at the Tevatron time, uh, you know, to search for the top quark uh, and, and much, much more. So we kind of align in our mission. And we, and we, we actually had INFN brought in for the complementary expertise and facilities that they bring. For example, one of the things we will do is measure some of superconducting qubits of very high coherence time down at Grand Sasso to study, for example, potential effects of, uh, of uh, radiation on qubits. So that's just one of the examples. We have Lorenzo, we have Stefania, we have many, many aspects that come together from NFN, from uh, the algorithms uh, to the actual device, to the materials, to the actual workforce development. So that's just to give you a glimpse. So you can see strange things like there's also as say, Goldman says people from Goldman Sachs. So it's really the full spectrum going from the expert in material to the end user. So we were asked to do to have a mission statement when we applied for this center. So what is your mission? What are you guys gonna do? Why should we give you $150 million over five years? What are you gonna bring to the table? Uh, we, and we were asked to tackle one uh, problem which was called, I mean, they asked a major cross-cutting challenge in the field of quantum information science. And we chose as major cross-cutting challenge, quantum decoherence and specifically in superconducting systems, 2D and 3D. So this is our mission statement. We bring together power of national labs, industry and academia to achieve transformation advancement and in this major cross-cutting challenge, why we have quantum decoherence, specifically in the superconducting platforms. 2D means a chip and 3D, as you will hear more uh, from Alex, means a 3D cavity, you may have heard already. This is kind of our background, our bread and butter, a Fermilab, but what we have demonstrated, we are the best in the world at, we make the best cavities with the highest quality factors. So they're the best resonators, the best Galileo pendulum, except, you know, it goes for billions and billions of years. Um, here you can see Grand Sasso uh, with the, the dilution fridge underground. These are the clean room facilities at NIST. These are some of our facilities at Fermilab. This is one of the Rigetti chips. So really from day one, all the expertise of the various partners kind of put together, we were able to hit the ground and run towards achieving this. So we wanna tackle quantum decoherence. We wanna make better systems, better qubits, scale it up to better systems uh, and, and demonstrate eventually, hopefully quantum advantage with quantum computers and quantum sensors. So this is what we call the science and technology innovation chain. Again, these centers are really called to tackle many of these innovation chain layers, levels. So, and that's a little bit of what I was telling you. We start from the materials. We strongly believe, I know many of you are probably on the more theoretical side, but the center is very, very strongly focused uh, on the technology. So we do believe that right now you have to tackle the problem of qubits being too noisy and you have to do it starting from understanding deeply the material properties. What's used in this qubit that, that causes decoherence. And so we have a huge collaboration of uh, you know, more than 70 PIs, uh, experts in all the most sophisticated, let's say surface analysis techniques, superconducting characterization techniques, all unleashed at looking at fragments of these qubits uh, and correlating the performance of the qubits with the actual nanoscopic uh, features that they find and feeding that back into the device fabrication to make better devices. So we start from materials, we try to make them informed from what's actually found there. We try to make better devices, so wire coherence, we integrate into systems, 
and eventually we scale up to quantum computing and quantum sensing platforms. So, so that's one of the powerful thing of bringing a, a national lab like Fermilab into this type of endeavor that yes, we are not IBM who has been doing this for much longer than us, but we have been building very complicated uh, superconducting systems like accelerators that employ cryogenics, employ superconducting devices, employ microwave techniques, uh, you know, magnetic shielding materials, uh, all the, 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 the technologies that are relevant for the construction of a quantum computer, we have, you know, mastered and we have, you know, very large facilities. So, so that's one of the things that we want to do. We want to scale up to large things because we actually have the ability and we have the facilities to do so. Um, and then one of the important things, of course, is, yes, you may have understood by now, I'm a technology person, so I do it just for the technology fun, but uh, we have many people like those in the audience that are your, your uh, instructors at this school that um, are really motivated by solving very complex problems with these quantum computers. And so that's the, the also added value that we don't work in silos, but really we try to push also towards a targeted application. So, okay, so what are our foundational technological strengths? I will be very quick on this. You'll hear more from Alex. Uh, the, the first thing that actually earned us, one of the things that earned us the center was this demonstration of uh, superconducting cavities in the quantum regime with uh, two seconds of coherence. So this is the state of the art is about here, like one millisecond for an empty cavity. Our empty cavity was demonstrated to be two seconds and you'll hear more of the details from Alex, but you can see the potential here. So if we could really have a qubit that leaves, uh, you know, a superconducting qubit that is, you know, easy to control and manipulate and, and that can live this long and scale it up, you know, we, we actually have hundreds of these cavities at our disposal. So in principle, once, you have one that works and you connect a few of them, you can easily scale up. Um, but so this is the perfect photon box, Einstein dream, uh, closer than ever to reality. Uh, so that's a cavity QED architecture. Um, what can we do with this? Alex will tell you more again, but the long coherence may allow to go from qubit to qubits approach that brings its advantages. Uh, uh, it, despite being bulky, this could make this architecture actually quite scalable because you could turn one of these multi-cell structure, for example, in 100 qubits equivalent processor. So uh, by being controlled by just one input line and one output line. So you, you combine essentially one of these structures with one transmon qubit, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and Alex will tell you more about uh, the details of this. But at the same time, I wanna stress that not only computing, we have a rich science program that looks at using the cavities and qubits to also probe some fundamental physics questions in the more quantum sensing and physics area. So for example, directly probing quantum to classical transition by building this uh, Schrodinger cat states of very large scale, uh, new physics like dark photon or axion searches uh, with potential orders of magnitude sensitivity, physics simulation, this is what you've been hearing at this school. Uh, another foundational strength is we were very strong in superconducting materials. Superconducting materials uh, are what these 3D cavities are made of. Uh, mostly we deal with niobium in these 3D cavities, but we deal also with other things. But we have been really pioneers in uh, you know, understanding the properties of this niobium and making these cavities uh, reach two seconds based on this understanding. Uh, we offer this knowledge also to the 2D world. So one of the things that we did is we actually stood up capabilities to make superconducting chips ourselves. So this is our group that makes superconducting qubits now. Uh, this is recent, it took us a few months, but uh, you know, we hired people, uh, these people you know, started to make qubits. It took, they were experts from NIST, from many places, but we now make superconducting qubits at the University of Chicago Pritzker Nanofab facility and NIST and Arrighetti. So we have this very large coordinated study uh, accessing different foundries across the country because not only we wanna demonstrate, you know, okay, we, you have one qubit that can make one millisecond. That's not enough, right? You want to demonstrate that you can do that systematically, that you can do it in a reproducible way and everybody can get the same results. So we're trying to adopt this approach. Um, so this is a part of what we do to achieve that. As I was mentioning, so we take uh, sections of these processors and then, for example, Rigetti sends us 
you know, this is a bad qubit, this is a good qubit, uh, and can you tell us what it is that make one bad and one good? And we dissect, and then we, for example, employ techniques like cryogenic TM, AFM, magnetic force microscopy, XRD, time of flight seams, uh, and, and, and much, much more. So we really, you know, we even employ, let's say, light sources uh, to go and study particular, you know, properties of these films uh, to really understand uh, what is causing decoherence. So maybe Alex will touch a little bit on this, but that is one of the very exciting areas of the center. Very active, as I said, very large collaboration, very excited by, you know, of course, pushing the performance, but also the science, the physics itself of these materials. And then our foundational strength of Fermilab is that we build these very large machines. Here you can see, this is a very large, you know, in scale, there is a person here. So this is a very large platform uh, that currently reaches four Kelvin, but we are actually repurposing this facility to become the world's largest dilution refrigerator. Um, so this will have a volume uh, which currently nobody can achieve of, you know, two meters in, I believe it's two and a half meter in diameter and more than a meter in depth and milli Kelvin and with the substantially higher cooling power. Why is that is important? Because if you want to scale up in terms of number of qubits, you need more volume uh, at milli Kelvin. And currently the largest dilution commercially available dilution refrigerator is much smaller than that. So again, this is part of like utilizing our expertise in cryogenics, so, you know, in building large structures and, uh, and you know, kind of bring into the, to the, to the field of quantum information science. Uh, so those are our goals, develop and deploy a prototype quantum computer Fermilab based on the SRF, uh, explore and demonstrate advantage for high energy physics, but also much more. Um, I, I found this kind of like, a, a, this is not showing well, but anyways, this was a really nice uh, extract uh, on why, why would we build a quantum computer at Fermilab. Um, Alex will tell you a little more about the performance uh, goals, but this was a schematic that some of our leaders at SQMS put together. Uh, Matt Rieger, Jens, Alex, they came together and they kind of, with the algorithms folks, I believe, and they tried to do some sort of like ambitious roadmap. Where can we go if we are successful with these systems that we are trying to build compared to the state of the art? I will not say much on this because I believe Soheib, uh, Hank, and everybody already told you about our goals, but you know, mapped to these technological goals, there are uh, simulation computation type of goals that go hand in hand with what the hardware the SQMS will develop can offer. Okay, so here we want to investigate and develop quantum algorithms and simulations enabled by these processors. And here are some examples, simulations of dynamics of the approximating QCD, LHC physics, uh, much, much more. Okay, so there is another part which is also exciting, which is the quantum sensing. We are working on using these technologies also and employ them as quantum sensors. Um, here is a very complicated slide, but let me go quickly through it. We have a five-year roadmap. Um, some of these experiments involve using cavities, for example, to search for dark photons or for dark matter, for axions. So, so what we do is we take these cavities that already are very, very sensitive detector and you bring them to the quantum regime and you use also tricks like with the qubits inside, inside the cavity to make them become essentially like single photon counters. So, so they become really, really sensitive tools. They will be able to capture even a single microwave photon. Uh, and we employ materials that may withstand also large magnetic fields. So therefore being able to also search for particles, hypothesized particles like axions. So uh, that is a very rich physics program. And again, we are a powerhouse of you know, cavities in very strange geometries with very advanced materials uh, and in this quantum regime. So we think that there is gonna be some really nice results coming out of this program. Uh, by the way, we have been looking also at other things. Our theorists have been thinking, you know, what else can we use these cavities in this type of uh, quantum regime for? And uh, one direction is, for example, as very sensitive gravitational wave detectors and more. This is uh, an example of how we just sent a postdoc. Actually, it's not showing correctly, but we sent a postdoc to take, you know, parasitic measurements uh, from some experiments that we were doing. And just in one shot, there should be a line here, which goes much deeper, essentially demonstrated the most sensitive experiment for wave-like dark photon. 
just in one shot. It's because you know it's, there's very low hanging fruit. It's the first time the cavity, perfect mirror boxes like these are in the quantum regime and we use them to search for this type of particles. And so it's, uh, it's very exciting. I wanna say that the exciting part of these centers as if you have not gotten this message yet is that it really brings together bridges, expertise. This is where it's working really well, for example, the, the, the theorists, uh, the experimentalists that are experts, let's say, in devices, the experimentalists that are experts in materials, uh, they come really together in this very virtuous circle of, uh, you know, here's an idea, can we use these cavities if they had this performance in this particular type of scheme to search for this, and then the people that can realize this, right, and the people that can realize the materials, and then, you know, and it feeds back and forth. Here is, for example, an example of how this cavity with a qubit inside you know, you can really resolve a kind of single photon lines. So it's really a very sensitive uh, single microwave photon counter. Um, we also are building new facilities. So I should show you some pictures here. Uh, of course, with a very large grant like this of 100 plus million uh, over five years. So we are doing research, but we are also building the facilities for enabling the physics experiments of the future. So we are building new foundry capability. We are building new physics test beds. And, uh, and uh, so here's an example of one of our quantum labs at Fermilab. So this is how they look like. Mm, dilution refrigerators, uh, a lot of electronic racks and so on to you know, control cavities and qubits. Uh, uh, these are some of our uh, excellent researchers. Uh, this is how a, a dilution refrigerator looks like inside. Um, this is some example of our cavities here. You can recognize Sylvia. Uh, she's obviously not posing here, but she's really doing an experiment. <laughs> um, here's an example of like a cavity that we, this is really cool. It's, an, it's a cavity that is designed to be tuned over a very large frequency range. It goes from five to all the way to nine gigahertz. And it actually has like piezo controls inside the dilution fridge to really scan this large frequency range which can become really important both for quantum computing or quantum sensing building blocks. Uh, and here are some of the pictures of the facilities in construction. We're actually adding six more dilution refrigerators. So that lab will be at least three, four times bigger, one of which will be with the, and so this will be finished uh, in January. We are inaugurating the new quantum lab in January. Um, this Sylvia will be talking about, we have a very large component of workforce development. So, uh, we have a very successful internship program every year, and Sylvia will tell you more about this. We have this wonderful GGI school, which now is in the second edition. The first one was virtual, but, uh, and then uh, we will plan more, maybe in a time of the year when it's less hot. <laughs> and then we also have a Caroline B. Parker Fellowship, and I'll let Sylvia talk about that. Um, we hired a lot of people because all of a sudden you have $100 million, you have to do stuff, you need people. <laughs> So we hired the firm of more than 40 people and across the center, I believe close to 100 people. Uh, you can recognize some faces here. <laughs> uh, and this is our roadmap that we typically present. So we really envision a decade where, so this is where we are right now. We actually have demonstrated our first qubit with the 3D cavity. Alex will tell you more about this, but of course we have to scale up from there. But let's say that the, you know, you know, making the first one work is the hardest part. Uh, we are making advancements in the coherence of the transman qubits so in the 2D. We are, I would say, probably the most successful endeavor in terms of materials research for superconducting qubits. We are delivering new facilities. So we are doing a lot of physics experiments. We are building this very large fridge. And our theory folks are thinking what to do once this hardware becomes a reality. Okay, that's all. Thank you. line here which goes much deeper essentially demonstrated the most sensitive experiment for wave like dark photon just in one shot it's because you know it's, there's very low hanging fruit it's the first time the cavity perfect mirror boxes like these are in the quantum regime and we use them to search for this type of particles and so it's uh, it's very exciting i want to say that the exciting part of these centers as if you have not gotten this message yet is that it really brings together bridges Expertise, this is where it's working really well. For example, the, the, the theorists, uh, the experimentalists that are experts, let's say in devices, the experimentalists that are experts in materials, uh, they come really together in this very virtuous circle of, 
you know, here's an idea, can we use these cavities if they had this performance in this particular type of scheme to search for this and then the people that can realize this, right? And the people that can realize the materials and then, you know, and it feeds back and forth. Here is for exa an example of how this cavity with a qubit inside, you know, you can really resolve a kind of single photon lines. So it's really a very sensitive uh, single microwave photon counter. Um, we also are building new facilities. So I should show you some pictures here. Uh, of course, with a very large grant like this of 100 plus million uh, over five years. So we are doing research, but we are also building the facilities for enabling the physics experiments of the future. So we are building new foundry capability. We are building new physics test beds and, uh, and uh, so here's an example of one of our quantum labs at Fermilab. So this is how they look like. Dilution refrigerators, uh, a lot of electronic racks and so on to you know, control cavities and qubits. Uh, uh, these are some of our uh, excellent researchers. Uh, this is how a, a dilution refrigerator looks like inside. Um, this is some example of our cavities here. You can recognize Sylvia. Uh, she's obviously not posing here, but she's really doing an experiment. <laughs> um, here's an example of like a cavity that we, this is really cool. It's, an, it's a cavity that is designed to be tuned over a very large frequency range. It goes from five to all the way to nine gigahertz. And it actually has like piezo controls inside the dilution fridge to really scan this large frequency range which can become really important of both for quantum computing or quantum sensing building blocks. Uh, and here are some of the pictures of the facilities in construction. We're actually adding six more dilution refrigerators. So that lab will be at least three, four times bigger, one of which will be with the, and so this will be finished uh, in January. We are inaugurating the new quantum lab in January. Um, this Sylvia will be talking about, we have a very large component of workforce development. So uh, we have a very successful internship program every year, and Sylvia will tell you more about this. We have this wonderful GGI school, which now is in the second edition. The first one was virtual, but, uh, and then uh, we will plan more, maybe in a time of the year when it's less hot. <laughs> and then we also have a Caroline B. Parker Fellowship, and I'll let Sylvia talk about that. Um, we hired a lot of people because all of a sudden you have $100 million, you have to do stuff, you need people. <laughs> So we hired at Fermi up more than 40 people and across the center, I believe close to 100 people. Uh, you can recognize some faces here. <laughs> uh, and this is our roadmap that we typically present. So we really envision a decade where, so this is where we are right now. We actually have demonstrated our first qubit with the 3D cavity. Alex will tell you more about this, but of course we have to scale up from there. But let's say that the, you know, you know, making the first one work is the hardest part. Uh, we are making advancements in the coherence of the transman qubits so in the 2D. We are, I would say, probably the most successful endeavor in terms of materials research for superconducting qubits. We are delivering new facilities. So we are doing a lot of physics experiments. We are building this very large fridge. And our theory folks are thinking what to do once this hardware becomes a reality. Okay, that's all, thank you. Before we go to Alex, uh, any questions? Uh, ask any question. No question? You wanna think about it? Okay. Let's go to Alex so we can, you can think about it. You have your own, right? Beside the science and development challenges, what other, other non-scientific challenges you are facing? Bureaucracy. <laughs> <laughs> Probably the biggest challenge. All right. <laughs> I'll be honest. You I mean, can elaborate on that. Yeah, standing up centers of this size is very complex. And so, I mean, literally it took us one year to stand up the center in terms of, you know, we have to send funds uh, to NASA and to other partners to do work, right? So you have to establish a contract, you know, so there's a lot of paperwork. So that 
you know, we have to order dilution fridges. I cannot just go and buy a dilution fridge, you know. It's a very long and complicated bidding process and, you know, rules. We are government laboratory. We have to follow a lot of regulations. So, so quite honestly, that has been a very heavy and tedious part. But I think we are at the point where we now have to worry less about this and finally we can think only about the science. Um, other things? No. Eh? What did you say? Ah, site site access. <laughs> yes. She she's right. This and she will talk a little bit more. Uh, hiring was very hard, so finding the right people to hire was nearly impossible. They launched five centers at the same time, six hundred million. Google is hiring, IBM is hiring, everybody's hiring in quantum. It's an explosion. So it's very, there's very tough competition. And finding the people with the right skill was also hard. And we stood it up through the pandemic, which made it hard in many respects in that sense. Uh, but I think we have been successful. In the end, you saw many people we hired, right? So, and I think that was because the goals are exciting. Um, but Sylvia will tell you more. That, that, that's, that's really true. We suffer the competition. I mean, we all the time lose people and we have to work on the retaining. Um, One more question. Are you interested in other technologies? Um, we actually currently are very, very focused on the superconducting platform. So we originally were thinking to do trapped ions, but then we were advised to really be a little more focused. And we think that already like this, the center is very broad. Uh, I believe that it is important that it is that the centers are somewhat focused, otherwise you do a little bit of everything, but also nothing. What guided you to this decision? To, do, to apply for the center? No, specifically choose superconducting. Ah, because of our... The question is what guided you to the decision of these particular platforms? because this was in our DNA in terms of expertise. We are superconducting RF people, so microwave superconducting devices and uh, materials like niobium. So we really did this because we wanted to bring something to the table in terms of expertise. Yeah, just to add to that, I think because we had a large, at least we thought so and still believe so, very large competitive advantage compared to all players in the market. So we had these resonators, you know, by a factor of thousand better. So that's why we, we thought, okay, this could be a huge impact. That's why we chose that. So uh, that's a good kind of segue. So uh, yeah, let me, I'll do a brief intro, a little bit more in detail about the technology. So I'm Chief Technology Officer at Fermilab uh, and uh, for SQMS, I'm the Technology Trust uh, leader. So let me, Try to change the. <laughs> okay, so I think this may be, yeah, this may be repetitive already, but just to, I, I guess you discussed. I'm sorry, I haven't seen the previous, you know, talks more. Uh, but so this is the, so all the superconducting qubit idea is based around the nonlinear resonator. There is a nonlinear resonator implemented most frequently as a Josephson junction. So, and this is just the LC circuit, which the only difference from a regular LC circuit is that energy levels are not equally spaced, uh, but because of this uh, dependence of the inductance of uh, Josephson junction on the current, so the frequencies of this resonator so for this uh, turns out to be non-equally spaced. So, and you utilize this fact to manipulate on the lowest two uh, states directly. So that's, that's it kind of. So there is no much, you know, uh, there is not much rocket science into what's, what's, what's up with the superconducting qubits. It's a relatively simple system. So it's LC circuit realized with two. So this is the realization example of two capacitor pads. So and this is a 2D uh, flavor. So two capacitor pads. So these two, you know, black boxes, uh, black squares here on the substrate, which is the thin layer of uh, niobium usually. That's another strand which connects to our primary expertise in SRF, where we build this huge cavities in bulk niobium. So we studied niobium kind of to death, all the properties of niobium, you know, what matters, what, what not, and so on. But so this is the, how these transmonds are, 
which you heard about. There are other flavors, but it's essentially different geometry of uh, this pad. And then connect it with the, where you see this red uh, circle. This where the, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know why it takes. Okay, I think this is better, sorry. So this is uh, how this Gerson junction looks like. So it's essentially just overlap of two um, conductors uh, separated by insulator. In this case, it's aluminum oxide usually. So it's aluminum, aluminum a bridge with aluminum oxide in between. So, and uh, this is how it looks like. So it actually looks very ugly. You know, this is the actual ICM image of this junction, but in, in reality, you know, it does, it's, it performs its function. However, this image also demonstrates, you know, the difference between ideal uh, model, which we think it is and what it reality, it actually is. And that's what kind of our strength is as well in the center. We studied to death this structure. We understand, you know, what, how exactly, what exactly the thickness is of this layer, how it depends on manufacturing parameters and so on. And that, that makes a big difference for coherence ultimately. So after you have this nonlinear uh, resonator, so, you know, you can probe it with the ref. Uh, this is example of, this is just a resonance peak for this LC circuit transmon. So, but then what the actual qubits are. So it's not just this transmon based thing. So you have to actually manipulate somehow the structure. You have to address it and read out quantum states. And that's where the other half of this story comes in, which is resonators. So there is any 2D or 3D architecture of the superconducting qubits contains transmons, resonators, and some sort of means, some buses. And you know, when it goes to processors, some connections between the qubits as well. But resonators are the key part. And uh, here's coming back to the earlier question. So like kind of why formula, you know, enter this area. So if you look at the, what the resonator, so what the quality factors, which ultimately, so what, what's important for superconducting architecture is to push the coherence as, as far as possible. So it's, it's very fast operations, very convenient gigahertz range. However, the qubits so far live very short. So like, you know, Google or IBM probably now more, but Google processes quantum supremacy demonstration was done with 20 microsecond lifetime of qubits, 20 microseconds. So just for reference. So, and, so that's why it's not much can be done, you know, not much circuit depth can be achieved, not too, not too many things can be performed. So, and then with the resonators, so what, in the same microwave range, so we had that formula of these resonators, which lived for, after some further development for seconds. So, and we built, you know, huge accelerators based out of these resonators. So that's, you know, that's a, uh, that provided for us a natural entry point. Can we move them to quantum regime and manipulate them, you know, with quantum states so that we achieve this uh, substantial progress in coherence? So, and then here you can see just some reference points, you know, for 2D QL is for 3D transmon that was proposed by Yale University. And in fact, one of the ideas was kind of eliminate surfaces to the extent possible. They thought that in 3D would be, uh, so the so-called two-level systems, we'll get to that momentarily, will be, effect will be minimized by just playing with electromagnetic field distribution, having it more in the volume rather than around the surfaces as in 2D. So, and it succeeded to the extent, but still the quality factors of resonators which were implemented there and therefore the coherence times records as Anna has shown, on the order of one millisecond. So a lot of potential there. And this is example of this 3D qubit architecture as a demo again. So you can see there is, a, there is a resonator. So in this case, it's a bulk aluminum. So it's half of this resonator, uh, bulk piece of aluminum. Uh, and then in between in these gaps kind of artificially made. So there's resonators, cav uh, cavities, and then this transmon, this is the, transmon in uh, this architecture put in between and that integrated system provides this, um, in this case, four qubit uh, quantum uh, processor. So, and then Yale University achieved great progress in demonstrating, you know, what, what this architecture in itself can achieve. So if you actually make the resonator high enough quality factor or long enough lifetime, then it actually makes sense not to use quantum states of the junction anymore of the transmon but to use the actual quantum states, longer lived quantum states in the resonator itself. So, and then, so that kind of the also uh, swap, which happened because the coherence of resonators improved substantially. But then, so what we brought in as a SQMS, so now 
we want to improve this coherence of resonator another factor of several hundred so and that's you know that so for us this is the natural approach to manipulate for quantum processors or other applications sense and so on quantum states in the cavity itself so the photons of the cavity not the uh, energy stored in the 2d lc circuit of uh, transmon okay anyway and this is just the a few things here you can look up uh, a lot of work uh, mostly by Yale University demonstrated various aspects of what could be done with 3d architecture and this is this devore sholkov plot where there is uh, you can see that 3d cavities so this is without including formula apps achievements yet so and this is uh, uh, this is up to 2015 you can see this is what the coherence where the top of the coherence for superconducting qubits was so and then uh, uh, this is essentially what we we have done so we replace it with the now with the Fermi lab cavities of various frequencies coupled with the Rigetti transmonds. So we are now manufacturing uh, transmonds also at the University of Chicago facility, Fermi lab uh, manufacturers. And then there's also NIST manufacturers, Pastor SQMS. So there's several these foundries which are able to make the um, uh, Joseph Junction based transmonds, which then are coupled with this very high coherence Fermi lab cavities to make the quantum system complete. So then this is Anna, Anna showed us this is again the foundational strength so maybe just uh, I won't stay much on it but uh, there is you know there is a lot behind this plot because there is a lot of uh, you can see there is also this special after 340 C after 450 C so these are special surface treatments which were developed to actually suppress the contribution of niobium oxides to decoherence so a it was understood that in the regime of quantum in the quantum domain unlike it was thought before with 3d so in actually the tls so-called two-level system do limit the performance also of 3d cavities and then if they do like where are they coming from from the oxide so we developed the technique uh, to eliminate it so this was our kind of foundational strength so this is demo of material science uh, secondary IMS spectroscopy this is uh, depth profile showing this pentoxide elimination so ultimately so that brought us so this is to you know given that we have the full grasp kind of, of the structure of niobium cavities we have very good transmonts we have a broad material program so this is the uh, t1 qubit t1 lifetime goals which we uh, implemented in our uh, plans so and then you know i think anna showed that and i don't know maybe it was discussed before but so these are substantial improvements again in uh, t1 lifetimes uh, and then also you know some assumptions about the gate times what would be the gate times so superconducting architecture has fast gate times and then this is we also hoping to have the substantial improvements in what matters ultimately this coherence of a gate uh, time ratio so how much can you do with your qubits uh until they break apart so uh i'll probably skip that but anyway so there were some controlled a lot of material science just demo uh, to understand uh we understand we use this very high coherence cavities to actually study different pieces contributing to the coherence so let's say now i'm excited how much does it matter if we have you know ideal surrounding very high q cavity in which we have just the oxide we can measure precisely what the contribution of this oxide is to losses which is not possible in 2d structures where there is many inter inter so there's many surfaces there's many uh, intersections there's many materials so this was you know this is the key strength we're actually using now to measure this piece by piece and then combine this knowledge uh, to uh, understand what is limiting current superconducting qubit so if you take for example the measurements of the oxide which we have done and just apply that you know to the current 2d qubits turns out that this you know, coherence limits of a few tens of microseconds which which I observe could be explained just by that oxide so you know the obvious target is we should eliminate the oxide that's what we are implementing as one of the key there's a huge effort with nanofab characterizations on to eliminate nebium oxide from 2d structures as well and demonstrate what we can achieve 
Okay, I'll skip probably that, but it's also important to understand uh, what, how much does the metal itself contribute? So oxide, you know, matters a lot, but metal itself does it contribute much? Because uh, if it does, then you have to target both. Turns out likely it's not the primary contribu contributor. So we think that uh, uh, niobium oxide is the primary target for this material uh, system. So how does it look? How do these 3D now SRF based systems look like? So this is an example. So this is the, the um, uh, here you can see this is the um, niobium cavity. Uh, I believe it was probably six gigahertz fundamental frequency cavity. Uh, and then you can see on this flange, so this is one of the antennas, and there is this rod silicon, so in this case, silicon substrate uh, manufactured transmon at the end of this rod. So there is a, uh, you know, two pads of niobium film with aluminum to aluminum junction. And then this whole structure, so this thing uh, is inserted inside the high Q SRF cavity. So this is how the uh, structure looks like. And uh, so what we what we are happy about, so it's a lot of, you put kind of a lot of junk, <laughs> roughly speaking, inside the very high Q cavity, junk meaning that there's a lot of foreign materials, which you, you don't want to have inside the high Q environment. So there is a, and the, we were, one of the first things was, you know, can we still keep the high Q with, when the integrated structure? And it turns out, yes. So it turns out you can, and this was one of the first iterations. So you can achieve tens of milliseconds without pretty much no optimization. So it's uh, progressing. So, and then, so then we had to learn how to operate now the structures in the quantum regime. So this is one of, so how these qubits work, I don't know if it was discussed already, but the primary thing is uh, this so-called dispersive interaction. So we operate in the dispersive regime, meaning the frequency of the qubit and the frequency of the cavity uh, relatively far apart. Uh, and then, so what, if you drive the qubit, so it undergoes so-called Rabi oscillation. So it oscillates between state zero and state one uh, in time. And then uh, um, you can sample this process. You can you know, read out this process using, using the cavity mode. So, and that's what represented here. <laughs> so, but, uh, the point here is to show that so now we have switched already from the classical operation of the cavities. Now we couple the system with this uh, gate transmon, and now we 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 are already it, it, we have the quantum processor, if you will. So now what we so this is showing you the uh, these uh, several uh, um, iterations. So several periods you can see here the. Uh, rabbit drive pulse length, so between this red and red blob, it's a few tens of nanoseconds. So that's the what's called the pi pulse, or the length of the pulse needed to bring the, uh, let's say, to flip the state of the qubit from state zero to state one. And then these are examples of quantum operations. You can measure then uh, coherence times of T1, T2, and so on of the qubit inside the cavity. But then Ultimately, in this architecture, we will see momentarily. So, what we want to do, we want to manipulate states of the cavity. So, it's in reverse. Uh, so, then we, we can also measure, of course, uh, the T1, T2, and, and other characteristic, coherent characteristic of the cavity modes. Uh, and uh, this is another just nice plot, kind of for those in experimental quantum domain. Uh, no, so this is the uh, how you can optimize and kind of fine tune the frequency which you use to drive the qubit. So this is the so-called Chevron plot. So where along the x-axis, so you vary the drive frequency, drive length for the qubit, and then you observe slightly different flavors of Rabi oscillations. And this is another thing which is important for physics sensing. So you can use now this very high Q as Anna mentioned, very high Q resonators as detectors. So if there are any physical processes which lead to the formation of photons in space seemingly out of nothing. And these processes are being seriously considered for, for example, for there could be dark photons, there could be axions, there could be several candidates for dark matter or physics beyond standard model. So and those man manifest themselves eventually, but it's literally just 
photons appearing out of nothing. And uh, it's very, very rare process. And you can control it by maybe generating the source in the other cavity. There is a specific experiment, dark SRF design. But so this, you can use this cavity. So here for each number of the photons in the cavity starting from zero. So we are very, very cold to start with in ground state. So which is this red. So, and then if there is one photon appearing in the cavity, you can sense it right away. So in this case with the, with the qubit, because we have the qubit coupled and the state of the qubit or frequency of the qubit transition depends on the number of uh, photons in the cavity. So these are all nice demos. So where are the bits? Just coming back again to the, so we need to, so we want to utilize the encoding based on cavity states because they are way longer lived. So, and we can, uh, you know, in the standard kind of binary qubit approach, we can call the ground state, no photons as zero, one single photon as one. So this would be Fox state encoding, or we can call even number of photons as zero, odd number as one. This would be, you know, different types. So there is a bunch of different types of encodings you can use uh, to, and that's what, you know, a lot of um, theoretical effort uh, uh, in, ongoing in parallel is trying to look into what, what is best, how to best take advantage of the uh, high coherence of these uh, structures. Um, and you can go one uh, step further. So instead of using just two, uh, so let's say zero and one photon in the cavity, because the states are so long lived, up to seconds potentially. So you can actually use way more states, which is not possible if you have, let's say, 20 microsecond qubit. So it's just not, so uh, because let's say for, if you have one photon lifetime of tau, so for n photon state, the lifetime will be tau divided by n. So if you have thousand photons state, it leaves thousand times shorter than your single photon, because if any of this 1000 photons gets absorbed, the state is destroyed. So, so if you have seconds, just a quick math. So if you, let's say if you have one second lifetime and we pack it, so we can pack it with 100,000 photons to achieve uh, uh, one microsecond, is my math correct? So one second divided by, no, one million photons. So if you, we can use up to one million photon states and the state of one million photons precisely in the cavity will leave still for one microsecond because of very long single photon lifetime. So, and that's, so this, what in, that's enables us to then potentially extend it to this, what we want to pursue is a QDIT state uh, approach, actually to take advantage of this, uh, to encode in just single mode, potential of this cavity, many qubits. So let's say if you can control N levels up to N levels, then log base two of N would be the effective number of qubits we can manipulate. Actually, here's exactly what I was saying just on the slide. Um, so this high coherence enables the QDIT approach. So and we are actually targeting potentially, we'll see where we land. Either we would have to make out of modules, but uh, so if you can control up to 10,000 photons per mode, uh, then it would be mathematically equivalent to 13 qubits. Okay, so what does, this is just recap, what does ref bias, uh, so, and ultimately, despite the structure itself being larger, you have essentially, as Anna mentioned, one in and one out. So one, so you cut tremendously on the wiring and all of this, which is associated with the, if you see the, you know, this dilution refrigerators with even one which Anna showed, one of the two has way more wiring than the other one, but pretty much bare bone, uh, a few wires architecture would be a huge, huge advantage of this 3D uh, approach as well. Okay, so this is kind of, I gave a very brief uh, overview. And uh, so superconduct qubits are both being advanced by us also in SKMS, and we also employ them to build uh, the QPUs, taking advantage of the coherence, uh, Primarily either with QDIT approach or then I think it's cut off here, but multi cavity interconnected uh, approach is another path we're pursuing. Uh, so we integrated this high QSRF cavities with, uh, so now we're manipulating quantum states. 
optimizing complement parameters uh, and so on. So this is kind of a snapshot of a SQMS effort and uh, I think that's all I had. Yeah, thank you. Any questions? So some beautiful Wigner functions at some point. Could you explain them, please? I don't think I had them in my presentation. They were a beautiful Wigner function with triangle symmetry. It was much earlier though. It looked like a cut state between three phases. Yeah, that's probably the yellow one, yes. So that's the... Um, that's uh, not ours. Oh, okay, sorry. Then that you don't have to... Then you we, don't have to... We, we have, yeah, we, we have similar... Uh, so that was actually, let me, let me get back to that because there is an important point there. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Wigner function, just for the audience, it's kind of very nice way to show the that the state has some quantum features, if you will. So, so you see this; it shows some interference. So non-quantum states would would have just essentially blobs here and there. So there will be no this interference of red and blue lines which you observe on the right side. Uh, so, and I believe this was the demo from Yale. Uh, here, let's see, it was. No, this is, I think on the 100 photon cat state, this is not that. I don't remember, you know, what exactly this Wigner function is for, but so the, the main point is that uh, I think one or two, so with this, so this 100 photon Schrodinger cat states, which is superposition of, uh, I believe they used with different phases of 100 photons with one phase and another alpha and minus alpha. So the same thing with higher coherence, we can push to, you know, much higher number of photons. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly also one of the plans. So that's not, it could potentially be used also for this computational stuff, but we also want to explore this, how big of a cat state can we create microwave cat state? So can you make cat state out of hot states? Uh, out of uh, what is hot? So you make a cat state typically from uh, the dis uh, yeah you know uh, like superposition between coherent states, but you could make superpos. Ah, this is complicated, but you could make like so, uh, coherent superposition of displacements mm -hmm. of a state that is not pure, even a hot, even a thermal state. Yes, you can. <laughs> so it's a great idea, potential. So in fact, perfect. If you, if you, you or anybody else have ideas like that, please just come forward and let us know. And we are open, so we don't have, so whatever we can demonstrate, especially taking advantage of coherence is of great interest to us. So if you have a specific you know, proposal, we are happy to, <laughs> to discuss. <laughs> Uh, you showed like a table with uh, gate fidelities and so on, and it seems you have really good gate fidelity, or you expect to have really good gate fidelity. So, I, I guess my question is why is why is the emphasis on having more qubits instead of error correction? Or like here, it seems that you really want to push the number of qubits, and you're not worrying as much about having logical qubits. No, so we want to have you know. It's not that many qubits, in fact. So we are pushing to have around 100, uh, 100 plus qubits, right? So we want to have similar, it's a similar level of qubits, which is now on the market. However, we actually pushing the quality in that sense. So we are trying to push the coherence as far as possible while preserving pretty much the gate fidelities. So we want to, so I think we are pushing in the direction, not of the number, we are pushing in fact in the direction of the quality. So they push in the direction of the number where you can do, you know, error correction, potential into D and so on. So we are not pursuing that in fact. So, because we, you know, kind of our strengths are in the coherence, if you will. So, and the, not in the design of super large structures with the low coherence. So, yeah. I'm just curious also with this uh, table, 
Um, there's this big difference in connectivity between 2D and 3D, um, whether that will have you know, significant impact on the computation you can do with. Um, Absolutely. Computer. So that's, in fact, another important point. I don't play it a little bit. But so in this QD kind of when you pack everything to one mode, which is physically, you know, the same volume also. So in fact, the, you can effectively achieve all to all connectivity of this effective qubits encoded in this um, column. So, and yes, so again, people at SQMS working on how can you take the most advantage of it? Like algorithms, you know, is it best to have algorithms with just, you know, two qubit gates or algorithms with all qubit gates? Or, so it, no, it's a, it's a very important direction. So, and, you know, there is, I, I don't have the latest, but other people probably in this audience can, can I don't know, Hank and others perhaps can speak to it, yeah. Other questions? Okay, so now Sylvia is going to talk. Okay, Thank you. thanks. Thank you. Yeah, so um, I will cover just a few minutes on uh, kind of reiterate something that was already said, and then talk about the workforce development. Um, and then I think there should be some remarks from the INFN President Antonio Zoccoli uh, at 5.15, right? So yeah, just a few minutes. Um, so, you know, quantum advantage at SQMS, you learn today a lot. Anna and Alex about what we do um, and about our facilities. Uh, so this is just a short list of what uh, our facilities are and what we can offer for workforce and so for ecosystem. Um, so there is a material science. Uh, you learn that you know to improve performances, you need to study materials. Um, Millie Kelvin test bed. So this is cryogenic and radio frequency platforms. Uh, there is a device fabrication. We talk about 2D and 3D. And there is also algorithm and, uh, you know, like uh, applications for high energy physics, but also feasibility studies and analysis on computational bottleneck that can be also outside high energy physics. Um, so like in this frame, like one, one thing that we are pushing is so for the ecosystem is so called the pilot programs. Uh, this is like a, an SQMS investment to uh, make good use of uh, our skills, facilities and expertise uh, for the general public, the society and so on. Um, and uh, again, like we are learning a lot in these days about high energy physics, but there are also other applications. Um, and here, uh, that's why this was uh, just uh, announced that we are starting a collaboration with the University of New York uh, Langone uh, to study methods uh, for uh, quantum, to study quantum computing algorithms to improve the sensitivity, the, the, the sensitivity and the, the resolution of these MRI pictures. And in this way, we can perhaps uh, detect defects in the MRIs or you know, we can make diagnosis more efficient. Um, and then about the workforce development, uh, um, the, here there are sort of our three flagship programs. Uh, we do more than that, uh, but this is uh, basically sort of recurring programs that we have. So we have the SQMS undergraduate internship. Um, this slide is not up to date. So the 18 students was for last year, for the 2021, that was virtual. So you see the picture of the Zoom. 
our of our recording Zoom meetings that we were having. So for this year, we have 11 students uh, in person, not only at Fermilab, but also at other uh, partners. So there are some at Fermilab, some at Northwestern, uh, some at uh, um, Colorado Boulder. Uh, there is uh, There are some interns that are co-supervised. Uh, for example, uh, Peter Orth, who is here, is uh, like one of our supervisor for, for the program. Um, we really want to engage, and actually, uh, it's interesting to see that quantum computing is an emerging technology, and uh, it's very interesting to see how uh, so-called historically underrepresented minorities are getting interested into this. Um, so, like, we hire about 50% between women and the URMs. Uh, and we don't make, I want to say, and I cannot stress this enough, we really have an overwhelming uh, amount of applications from this demographics group. Um, so it's very interesting to see how uh, quantum computing is interesting, you know, for girls and also other groups. Uh, there is the Carolyn Parker Fellowship. Uh, this is uh, the first fellowship dedicated to the recruitment of only URMs, underrepresented minorities. Uh, it is named after uh, the first African-American woman to earn a postgraduate degree in physics. Um, if you have time, just go online and read the story of uh, uh, Caroline Parker because uh, it's very inspiring and interesting uh, to see what she did also for the country, for the United States. She was working the Manhattan pro Project um, and uh, she didn't earn a PhD at MIT because she died days in, uh, for leukemia for the radiation of her work on the Manhattan Project. So it's just very interesting and inspiring and then uh, there is a GGIE and SQMS summer schools, and here we are. Um, so for uh, last year, we had a virtual school, and this year it, was in, it is in person. So I'm very glad to see you all here. Uh, we have about, we'll say some fun numbers on, on Friday. We, I think we have about 30 students in person, 35 in person. Some could not make them last minute, um, and about 35 registered online. We are publishing all the uh, slides and videos online that will, that will be available for you. Um, so this is our class for the 2022. These are not only the interns, but there are also the mentors um, and uh, some, uh, the, there are the direct supervisors and there are also mentors like postdocs or graduate students um, at uh, the, the SQMS Center. Um, so it's, it's a really great program. The way like a summer internship work at Fermilab, but in particular at SQMS is that uh, uh, the interns are assigned a supervisor and a research project and uh, the uh, the program length is about 10 weeks during the 10 weeks you have to accomplish your research project participate to the weekly meeting and the, but the most important fact stuff is that you need to learn about what you're doing you know like uh, learning by research and by doing um, so it's mostly you know it's not really about having the stuff done but it's mostly an experience for you for learning and and yeah and what also we mentioned like we have to develop like the future workforce uh, for quantum because um, as you know things progress we will need more and more skilled uh, professionals um, yeah, and uh, this is a summer school, um, so we offer travel support um, for both US and the European students and also outside Europe, um, and I think it's just, to me, it is going great, I hope you are enjoying <laughs> uh, the school, and yeah, next year, probably we are going to plan a sort of an intensive school in the US for uh, um, uh, like, a, like a two or one week or two weeks intensive program with uh, hands-on experiences and so on. So if you have, if you want to know what we do or if you have any questions, I think the best way to learn about opportunities is uh, you know, to connect on our social platforms or uh, to go on uh, like our website. Usually we publish there everything. Uh, everything most most of the time <laughs> we do. Um, or there is my email address so you can always write to me um, if you're seeking for an opportunity or uh, you know if you're looking for a project and so on and we try to see if we have uh, the bandwidth to do that uh, yes and this was my last slide sure. um, So 
do questions. we have yeah questions yes Just in terms of um, the, the overall research program, uh, you did mention in the beginning that you also have people from other fields, you know, working on the long-term applications, like, uh, you know, medical stuff, you even mentioned like climate change and stuff like this. Uh, to what extent do you put that on there, you know, for, you know, having a, a, a broad program and, or is it, it's probably not at the core of your research, right? It's just to have it ready once we move to that stage. Just how advanced is that? Sorry, just to make sure I, I, I heard the question well. You're saying at the beginning that we have very... Uh, yeah, in terms of like these future applications with really quantum computing, because yeah. I guess like the consensus from like discussing the past few days, we've all felt, well, yeah, no, for quantum physics, for sure, quantum computing is definitely a thing. Like we can learn a lot, but kind of, you know, the those applications that go beyond into finance, into something climate change, you know, that's maybe more for getting funding or, or something like this. Um, <laughs> it, it, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure you have reasons to put it on there. So like- Oh, no, no, they, whatever we put there, so there are part of the real yeah, working yeah. groups. Yeah, so that's <laughs> um, why I'm interested. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I don't know, Goldman Sachs is uh, Will Zeng, for example. What, uh, so ah, is books that, in the algorithms yeah. group, right? So, um, you know, it's it's really bringing people from various that are, you know, in mm -hmm. So it's not, you know, just just PR, you know, yeah. it's... Uh, Again, we we are are we there yet? We are not there yet, but we do believe that these centers are very, you know, focused on what's called the co-design, where eventually you have to get people together with the application folks and then tailor the development of the hardware to the application. I don't know if that answers your question, but you know, it's interesting to hear from people who are actually leading these centers, whether they, like how strongly you believe that that application is real, you know? I, I, I mean, I think, I think we have to do it for the application. Otherwise, you know, it will never materialize into anything. Um, so I, I, I think it's the only way to do it. So for us at Fermilab, you know, the fact that we, we have our own physics drivers, right? I think it's crucial. I mean, the motivation eventually will drive this thing to the finish line. Maybe Hank can say more. <laughs> If all you think about is the really long term, like fault tolerant era, then a lot of these things are going to have, you know, the Python import quantum linear algebra solver. And so in that case, you know, the people doing finance and the people doing high energy physics are going to be doing the same thing. So, you know, who we have is mostly going to be a function of what they're passionate about, but the actual sort of algorithm under the game is not the same. End up being very structured, and that's why I end up talking to the finance people. Condensed matter people, because we all, you know, the number of ways you get speed up in quantum computing is very small. So, if Trump doesn't fit that, then you're sort of not working. But I'm not quite so unique. I was just also the application folks, they keep us motivated. Every day they call us and say, Is the hardware ready yet? <laughs> Anna enjoys my commentary. Yeah, to, 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 very popular. To, actually, today Hank just told us that he needs 10 to the 8 physical qubits. <laughs> so, so, yeah, maybe. Maybe one more thing that I can add on that is that, you know, these programs that we support also, you know, some sort of comp synergistic, but uh, complementary to high energy physics. Um, our goal is really to advance the field with our expertise, but we also expect that uh, the PIs or, you know, like uh, the research groups that we partner with, then, you know, they could find uh, additional um, uh, grants opportunities, you know, that also are based on the work that we do together. So it's, yeah, it's really to advance the field and also to look forward.
Any other question? So, uh, <clears throat> since I'm not a student, I will ask the question that probably every student is thinking, but nobody is daring to ask. And that is career opportunities offered by these centers, as we actually know. Uh, I, I hope you, you're super brilliant people. So, uh, sooner or later, even you will have to face the fact that, like, academia is absolutely a brutal environment for career. So I was wondering, I imagine that they are curious to know what uh, long-term career opportunities these research centers offer yeah, for so young researchers. We, and like me and Anna, probably also Alex, uh, at some point we were uh, summer interns at Fermilab. Um, so, and I think this sort of answer probably the question. Um, so, you know, like usually you will do like a summer internship or get involved somehow with the researchers. Um, and then you will do like a PhD research or uh, you do a master thesis program. Um, and uh, yeah, you, you just progress uh, as things go. Does it answer the question you want no, to add? No, no. no, no. <laughs> yeah, no. Because, because at the university, you also follow this model, and yet you have no guarantee at all. Is it the same? No. I mean, I can answer for National Lab. I'm a National Lab person, and these centers are based in National Labs, although we do support also university students and both that way. But I don't control, you know, if I'm... Well, we do have... For example, positions also in Northwestern University, so we do have some say, you know, in hiring some professors there. But let me answer for 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 national labs. I think what Sylvia was saying is that it, at least for our experience, is very meritocratic environment. And you know, personally, by bringing results to the table, I went from postdoc. You know, a few years later, became. Um, associate scientist, which is kind of equivalent of uh, associate professor. I'm now senior scientist, which is full professor. I'm 40 years old. I mean, I can say how old I am. So I think national labs are a really good environment. You know, if, and, and Hank can comment too, in terms of if you bring results, you can progress. And personally, I like it very much, perhaps more than university because you don't have teaching duties. So you can really focus more on research. But you can also have, you know, some management duties if you like it. You know, I've been group leader. You know, I've done other things. Um, centers. I think you asked specifically about the centers. We hired. We created a new division, and we hired literally like more than forty people, thirty-five something, and we had the various level. We had postdoc, and we hired associate scientists. The ones that we hired as postdoc level, actually, we already transitioned to to associate scientists. So, which is actually, you know, once you're an associate scientist, unless you do very poorly, but if you publish, it's a permanent position in the national lab. So I think, so now the question I think will be asked is, is quantum a bubble? And uh, then how will you support these people in the long run? But DOE has actually recently made clear that they're very supportive, for example, of quantum becoming a core competence at Fermilab, which means really, something that they will support long-term. And so I feel strong that, for example, National Labs, it provides a really nice opportunity for career path. Hank was hired as associate scientist. So he's basically, yeah. yeah. So, so, you know, it, he keeps going in a couple of years, he becomes permanent staff, which is scientist one. Um, big and an NSF thing about, you know, talking about what the priorities of our field as a whole in high energy physics is. And it was very clearly given to us from both the DOE, the NSF, universities and labs that quantum computing is going to be an integral part of the funding scheme for high energy physics, both experimental and theory for the foreseeable hiring future. So if you're asking about the likelihood of career paths, this is probably one of the few places, at least in high energy theory, where you can expect jobs as opposed to stagnation or yeah. So be excited. Yeah. I, I I think 
what I tell all our folks who worry about this, I say, I tell, no, don't worry. Just do good science. I think we, when we have brought to the table good results, we have been rewarded always. And so that's my advice. Yeah, maybe I can add. I think people, and I think to a large extent, probably in Europe, significantly more, do not realize how big of an opportunity and uh, in general national labs in the US are. So how much you can do research wise, you know, how quickly you can progress in your respective area and so on. So it's a big, big opportunity and plus quantum. Now I think it's unique opportunity, which I'm not sure it will you know, last forever. So I highly encourage all of you guys to consider a, the careers in uh, in quantum potentially, you know, on various levels. And then of course, to consider national labs in the United States specifically, and of course, other places, but I be in the Fermilab, you know, employee for, I guess, 13 years now, I really never thought of going anywhere else, neither academia nor industry. So it's, it's really, you know, very productive environment. It, now coupled with quantum, superb. So. My advertisement is over. <laughs> Peter or we also top scientists at a national level. I don't know if you really care about the top Okay, I I suggest we transition to the general Q and A questions. Uh, for all the speakers of today are here. So again, like last days, if you have specific questions about the talks, including this one. Or if you have general questions about the field, these are experts of the field, please go ahead. Uh, I had a question about, uh, there's been recent generalization of tensor network states to so these neural network quantum states. Yeah. And I was wondering if you have something to say about like how expressive slash, like how efficient it is to optimize them and so on and so forth. Okay, by the way, I forgot to say, also people online, we can see the chat or they can chime in. So I think this is a question that is meant for me, or at least I, I think I have the tools to address it. Um, you have in mind a Boltzmann machine? That is actually a very specific class of tensor network. It's actually a diagonal tensor network. So it's relatively simple. To be honest, you can actually train tensor networks to do supervised on unsupervised learning. So like you use the same construct that I showed you this morning, so tensor network as a way actually to make um, variables communicate because that's what a Boltzmann machine does, right? It's variables that are interconnected through some sort of linear pathways and so on. And the tensor is just a little bit more sophisticated way. Then all the, all the thing that you have to do is to convert um, your, your learning algorithm into an algorithm that work for that um, specific architecture that you have in mind that is the Boltzmann machine or whatever else. Uh, actually, some colleagues of mine, not me, Timo Felser, um, tried to use the Boltzmann machine lurging algorithm for a tree tensor network architecture, obtaining actually very promising results. I invite you to check his paper because honestly, I, I'm really not into machine learning <laughs> myself. So you have to learn to, to but, but yes. Great. Other questions? Curiosities, general comments? Okay, so then I guess we're ready for the Galileo visit. I I think we can very slowly diffuse towards Galileo's house. Thank you everybody for